Chapter 3 is Neural Control of Exercising Muscle. Uh, the first thing it's important to review and make sure you have a clear understanding before we move on in this chapter is the basic organization of the nervous system. So the nervous system has two parts. We've got the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Uh, we often refer to the central nervous system as CNS. Okay. The central nervous system consists of the brain and the spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system um, branches out, so you've got the brain, you've got the spinal cord, and then the peripheral nervous system are the nerves that branch out from the central nervous system. So the peripheral nervous system has um, two major divisions. We've got uh, the sensory nerves, okay, and the sensory nerves are the nerves that are sending information to the central nervous system about what's going on in the body. And then we've got uh, the motor division, or the motor nerves, that are sending information out to the body, uh, telling the body how to respond based on the sensory messages that are coming in. Okay, So we've got information coming in to the CNS, and we've got information coming out from the CNS. And those nerves coming in and out make up the peripheral nervous system. <clears throat> In this chapter, we're going to focus a lot on um, some sensory nerves, um, and we're going to get to that. Um, we've already talked about motor nerves. Okay, Motor nerves are the nerves coming out from the CNS um, telling the body how to respond. And some of those motor nerves go to our skeletal muscle. And that is the somatic division of the motor nerves. So we've got somatic motor nerves and autonomic motor nerves. Uh, the basic difference is that the somatic nerves are based on voluntary responses. So you make a conscious decision in your brain to do something, you know, to do a biceps curl. Uh, we've got an action potential. It originates in the spinal cord, uh, it originates in the brain, goes down the spinal cord, uh, comes out through motor nerves, uh, eventually ends up at skeletal muscle and tells the skeletal muscle what to do. So that's what we've talked about in chapter one where the action potential uh, arrives at the neuromuscular junction and um, ends up transmitting an action potential across the sarcolemma and causes muscle contraction. So that's the somatic division of motor nerves. What we really haven't talked about yet, and we will talk about more this semester, is the autonomic division um, of the motor nerves. So these are motor nerves that come out, again, from the CNS, but they cause involuntary responses. Okay, So these are things you're not consciously deciding to do, but things that are going on in your body all the time. And the autonomic nervous system has two divisions. We've got the sympathetic, which we call SNS, and we have the parasympathetic, which we'll call para-SNS. Okay. The reason I don't call it PNS is because it can get confused with peripheral nervous system. So if you just say PNS, uh, it's not clear if you're saying referring to the peripheral nervous system or the parasympathetic nervous system. So it's just best to say para-SNS. So the two divisions of the autonomic nervous system are the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. And the sympathetic, which you've heard all about, is basically our fight-or-flight division. Okay, and this is the division that is predominant during exercise. Okay, so at any time, remember I've told you um, that nothing is ever 100% or 0%. So at any time, the SNS and the para-SNS are both active. Okay. 
But depending on what's going on, one of these divisions is going to be more active than the other. And the division that's more active is the one that's going to take control um, over the body at that point in time. So even at rest, we've got some sympathetic output. Okay? But at rest, the primary effect on the body is coming from SNS. Okay? During exercise, the primary effect on the body, uh, I, para, para SNS. Uh, during exercise, the primary effect on the body is coming from SNS. So depending on what's going on, okay, if we've got more output from SNS, then SNS is going to take control. But if we have more output from para SNS, para SNS is going to take control. So we often call SNS fight for flight, uh, prepare for action. Uh, it's the body's response to any type of a stress. And we're going to be talking a lot about the SNS this semester. The parasympathetic nervous system is predominant at rest and is responsible for housekeeping types of activities. Okay, so sometimes we call this rest and digest. Okay, so this is when there's not any stress demands on the body and therefore the body is doing its basic housekeeping. It's digesting, it's um, replenishing cells. Old cells are dying off, new cells are being formed. Uh, and that's para-SNS. These two systems are usually antagonistic, right? So um, they oppose each other. Uh, but the final outcome of what happens in the body is going to be based on um, how these two systems work together. So the more activated one system is than the other, the greater effect that system is going to have. All right, review of a neuron. We did talk about this in chapter one. So the neurons leave the central nervous system. Okay, and the cell body, this portion of the neuron, is in the central nervous system, for instance, the spine. And action potentials originate in the CNS. Uh, they arrive in the dendrites of the neuron. From there, they go to the cell body, down the axon, and the action potentials eventually arrive at the axon terminals. And from there, the action potential can be transmitted either to another neuron or the target tissue. And the target tissue we primarily talk about this semester is skeletal muscle. Action potentials can only travel in one direction. They're not going to go backwards. Um, here we have um, the myelin sheath, which we talked about before. Um, it insulates the axon, and it allows the action potential to travel faster. And remember that in a type 2 fiber, we have a larger axon because there is a greater myelin sheath. That allows the action potential to travel faster, and that's one of the reasons why type 2 fibers are fast twitch. All right, so we've used this term a lot already. So an action potential is basically an electrical signal, an electrical current that rapidly travels along a, the cell membrane of neurons and muscles. And it's, so it's an electrical signal that's carrying a message. Okay. Um, we're not going to go into the details of the development um, and transmission of an action potential. Your chapter does go into that detail and it's, it's very interesting, um, but for our purposes this semester we don't need to go into that detail. But I will say that um, an action potential is initiated by something called depolarization. Okay? And depolarization can have different strengths. If the depolarization is strong enough, 
it will result in an action potential. So you can have depolarization occurring um, in a nerve or in the CNS, and if it's weak, we won't get an action potential out of it. But if it's strong enough, and if it reaches what we call threshold, then an action potential will be initiated and it will be carried and propagated, right? We've talked about um, all or none. Okay. And all or none means a few things. It, it means that a motor unit is going to fire completely or not at all. Um, also, an action potential, you're not going to get um, a partial action potential. The depolarization is either going to be strong enough to cause an action potential or it's not going to be strong enough to cause an action potential. Okay. If we get an action potential, then we get that electrical current that travels along the neuron and is carried to some target tissue um, to send a message to that target tissue. Now, neurons connect to other neurons. Okay, and neurons connect to neurons at synapses. Okay, so here we have a presynaptic neuron and we have a postsynaptic neuron. Okay. And so where these two neurons come into contact with each other are called a synapse. So we've got the axon of one neuron. And then we've got a synaptic cleft, which is a little space. And here we have the dendrites of the postsynaptic neuron. So the action potential arrives here at the axon terminal. At the axon terminal, terminal we've got these synaptic vesicles containing neurotransmitters. When the action potential arrives, it causes these neurotransmitters to be released into the synaptic cleft. They float across the space. They bind to the dendrite and cause the action potential to be propagated through that neuron. Okay, so an electrical signal temporarily becomes a chemical signal and then becomes electrical again. Okay, so we, we talked about this a little bit in chapter one. This is how an action potential goes from one neuron to another neuron. And the same thing happens when that neuron eventually arrives at the target tissue. And remember, our tissue that we are talking about is muscle. So when the neuron eventually comes to muscle, Okay, we don't call it a synapse, we call it a neuromuscular junction. So we've got the neuron here, we've got the muscle here, and this whole thing is called a neuromuscular junction. Okay, so again, it's the same process. We've got an action potential arriving at uh, the axon terminal. It causes these synaptic vesicles to go to the end of the axon, open up, and release neurotransmitters and primarily acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft, which floats across, binds to the surface of the muscle fiber, which we call the motor end plate, and then the muscle picks up that chemical signal and initiates an action potential that goes across the sarcolemma, down the T-tubules, causes the release of calcium, calcium goes to troponin, etc. Okay, so, and they're, it's, they're not actually physically in contact with each other, there's a cleft, there's a space. So again, an electrical signal temporarily becomes a chemical signal, so it goes from an action potential to a neurotransmitter, and then the neurotransmitter binds and starts the action potential again, and then it gets transmitted through the muscle. <clears throat> again, we're not going to go into a ton of detail um, about the way they're propagated, 
but um, it is important to talk about a few things that are going to come up later. So we have action potentials that can either be excitatory or inhibitory. Okay. Uh, an excitatory action potential is called excitatory postsynaptic potential, EPSP. Okay. Uh, an inhibitory potential is called inhibitory postsynaptic potential. Okay. And just as you would think, excitatory is going to cause a stimulus inhibitory is going to prevent a stimulus okay? and this is based on what happens at the post synapse so at the target tissue you're getting excitatory messages you're getting inhibitory messages at the same time the result of what happens in that tissue depends on summation okay so again we've got these signals arriving and some of these signals are excitatory and they're causing depolarization at that target tissue. We also have some signals arriving that cause the opposite of depolarization which is hyperpolarization. So these would be inhibitory. Okay. And summation is going to be the result of these two processes happening. Okay, so very simple terms. If you've got five excitatory signals and you've got three inhibitory signals, the summation would be two excitatory. Okay, so the end result in that tissue is going to be based on a combination of depolarization and hyperpolarization and which one is predominant. Okay, so if the predominant signal is depolarization, excitatory, and if the level of depolarization is enough to reach the threshold, then the action potential will be propagated and the target tissue will respond. So we won't need, we are not going to go into what that threshold is. Um, you can read about it in the chapter if you're interested. But um, the, the target tissue summates all the messages coming in. Okay, and all those messages are summated at the axon hill, hillock. And so the axon hillock keeps a running total of all incoming responses. And if the total, sum total of responses is enough to reach threshold, we're going to get an action potential. Okay, so in this case, if threshold was 2, then this signal would be propagated. Okay. On the other hand, if we had uh, this coming in, okay, then the summation would be plus 3, okay, because we've got plus 4 minus 3, oh, I'm sorry, not plus 3, plus 1, okay, that's our summation, and if threshold is 2, we haven't reached threshold, okay, so what happened in this situation was there was enough inhibitory signals coming in to prevent threshold from being reached and even though there are excitatory signals coming in they were not enough to overcome the inhibitory signals and so we will not get an action potential okay so IPSPs and EPSPs